would be great, um, but we will endeavour to finish uh, fairly, fairly promptly and in, in a timely way. Um, our closing speaker, it's, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Al Ross. I was going to say, actually, there's quite a lot in the programme about him. Uh, I was going to tell you, I was going to ask you what you think the following have got in common, which is drumming in a rock band, uh, being a safety officer in the nuclear industry, uh, being an almost professional cyclist, almost, but <laughs> close, uh, but I cycling from Scotland to Paris for a conference, that's quite good. That's how I got to know him on that circuit. <laughs> well, he, he kept cropping up in my rear view mirror. <laughs> Get off my back, man. Come on, you know. And I just put the foot on the pedal. Um, and um, and being, a, being an international commentator on poker. What about that? All of that is wrapped up in Al Ross's mind. So that might explain a lot of what you're going to get in the next 45 <laughs> minutes. And on that note, I'll hand over to Al. Thank you very much. None of which is true. Um, but what is true is I do tend to endlessly repeat myself. And I think that's why I'm in this slot. So you, you can sort of get the gist early on. And then if you have to go, which is obviously... <laughs> it's necessary and it's not compulsory to stay and please do go if you have to go you'll have kind of, kind of got what I'm on about from the start so I think that's maybe um, what this is all about um, yeah so um, we'll start off let's run overview <laughs> so that's the that's one theme is it, it's, sort of ra it's a kind of polemic against reductionism and proceduralization and the idea that if you just understand little bits of everything that somehow the whole will emerge from that that paradigm um, <laughs> I have no declaration of interest uh, financial I'm supported by asked me to come here uh, by expenses but basically I have no Cayman Islands you know um, sort of tax arrangements. I just have research funders and I'm on the board of the journal BMJ Stell. If you send in human factors type patient safety papers, they might end up with me. And that's, that's really, I'm only selling ideas, I think. <laughs> and I work at Glasgow Uni, as um, says, and it's beautiful, isn't it? It's sort of leafy and, and this is where I work. Um, <laughs> so a, a, the, the, de the dental school features heavily on a website called Scottish Brutalism. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's the, it's the finest example of Scottish <laughs> brutalism since Eddie Gray and uh, Billy Bremner uh, both appeared in the Leeds United team in the 70s and th that build that's a seamless link that buildings so I really want to talk about coping <laughs> and, and and stress and strain <laughs> and pressure <laughs> and fatigue I could just go on like this forever it'd be fun wouldn't it <laughs> And if I did so, if I, if, I, if I talked about barometers and things, you'd say, no, somebody at some point would probably say, stop. It's the wrong, it's the wrong conference. And specifically, what you would mean is it's the wrong context for using those terms in that way. But there's nothing inherent in a jumbled up collection of letters that gives meaning. Okay? You have to believe me. <laughs> it's the way in which the term is used. The basic Wittgenstein, the meaning of any word, phrase, or concept is really only in its use. It's how you, you, you have to define what you mean by something, and then other people can say, well, I mean something different, and then you can come to a decision as to whether you think it's useful or whether you agree or not. But there's nothing inherent in the words. If you don't believe me, um, I'd say go to Central Station and stand about um, in Glasgow, and when someone comes up to you, which they will, <laughs> and it'll be like this, but, you know, um, and says, have you got a light? You just say, yep, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm well furnished with lights uh, at home, and I, I also find them useful in my motor vehicle during the hours of darkness. <laughs> and you'll quickly become a philosopher of language, and you'll realize that wasn't what the phrase, it, that wasn't, the, it wasn't literally, have you got a light? It was being used in a different sense. And as an added bonus, as well as realizing terms kind of different meanings, you'll, you'll get a tour of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, probably, and <laughs> meet the, Scotland's wonderful NHS staff. And so resilience 
Yeah, it's, it started off in metals, you know, material science. There's all sorts of resilience about seagrass beds and coastal wetlands. 70s social work started talking about adolescent and family resilience, resilient communities. There's a whole literature in the business world about supply chain resilience and cash flow and things. And then we heard yesterday about big resilience, you know, pre disaster preparedness. And, and there's a big literature there. And most hospitals have people who are like head of resilience, who plan for those things. And it's a common metaphor, but really they're all quite different. And you just, you know, I, I, you have to use the term in the way that you use it and then hope that you can get your point across. And of course, there's this stuff. Resilient individuals and teams um, want you to sort of go commando, which is another term with multiple meanings. On, so, <laughs> and, and be resilient. You should be resilient and just cope with stuff. And of course, this is what people in the this is what prompted the talk. Actually, was seeing this tweet. Does anybody actually know Gordon Caldwell? I don't know him, but it's a pretty small world. I'm thinking somebody might. Um, um, and so he says he's angry about this idea that it should be made to be resilient rather than create work environments in which, you know, and, and very mixed emotions for me because I completely agree. I mean, I couldn't agree more, but my type of resilience is all about, this comes from the human factors world, but it's all about the work environment. Resilient organizations have really nothing to do with telling people to, you know, man up. Sorry about the term. And this article's from the New York Times, and it's called The Profound Emptiness of Resilience. And it's, again, it's the same. It's like this idea that it's all about character and persistence and not about questioning policy, you know, and the environment. And again, I agree, but just as this article was December 15, just about this time, Peter Jay and I and others had set up a center for applying resilience in healthcare. And you're sort of seeing this. It's a profoundly empty gesture and it might as well call the center you know the center for I don't know taking a big dump all over the staff and not questioning the organization you know it's really it's really difficult when you've got the term in your in your sort of academic work and people hate it so much and all I can plea is no tautology you know sort of so please don't sort of say I don't agree with something because I've and you say, why? So, well, because I've decided it's something that I don't like and therefore that's why I don't agree with it. So, well, please listen to definitions and then decide whether or not something is of any use whatsoever. That's the point. And it's unfortunate the term is really quite so widespread, but um, we do have to sort of try and get across to you how it's being used. And then you can say, well, I still don't, <laughs> I still don't like it. That would be fine, but at least you would be addressing it the way I use it. Um, it's not at all surprising, like at all, that um, we, we focus on the individual. It's a basic bias in psychology. We find it very hard to attribute to systems. We focus entirely on personal behavior. It's called the fundamental attribution error. And there's a brilliant study, a seminal study, that's known as the game show study, where people were asked to look at um, a game show, watch the film, and then ask, and were asked who was intelligent. And they all said the question master was intelligent. The observer said it, so did the contestants. Th there's a clue. They, they, they've got the answers in front of them. I mean, it's a classic environmental cause, but we still think they're bright because they go, oh, 18th century, I don't think so. <laughs> we rate them as intelligent. This is the same as nurses. If a nurse doesn't know something, it's like stupid, don't know what they're doing, don't know what they're doing. But anyone in healthcare who doesn't know what they're doing is, is, is a failure of training or selection or communication or the IT system's down or something. It, I can't just look at the proximal and look at the person all the time. Systems give rise to appearances and it, it's closely tied to our protective psychological need to believe in a just world, which is another hypothesis. So we want to believe in heroes and villains. We like to think that people who go to jail or commit, you know, <coughs> serious harm in healthcare. We like to believe people who go to jail are bad, despite the fact it's overwhelmingly predictable in any statistical model by postcode or by race. And it's the same with people that en end up in high office and for which, you know, to whom good things happen. We like, we have to, we like to believe they must have some qualities. I used to rant about this with George, George Bush here. You know, well, they must have, he must, I must have worked hard at least to have some abilities, you know, because he's the president. His dad was the president. I mean, there's a clue. 
this is a pastor. I mean, this, I mean, he got into Yale without having to submit any, submit any exam results. He just got in as a family legacy and you know, dodged the draft and all the rest of it. Systems give rise to outputs. And the biggest system causes war. War changes everything and behavior goes haywire, but we still, in wartime, think there's sort of good people and bad people. And then, of course, in the, in the West, you know, in Britain, we fight for honor and glory, and Americans fight for liberty. I don't know what happens down in Australia, but German and Japanese people seem to fight because they want to ravish white women and sort of sexually <laughs> assault them. You would never catch any men in Britain and America having those type of desires. And so we, you look at systems, it gives rise to behavior, and again, we want to focus on these people, they, these, these girls here in pop music, they must be, I don't know, exhibitionists. Nah, it's just pop music system. You've got to look at patterns. The same for the blow. My grandfather, Johnny Ross, he was, he, was, he, was, he was in a famous harmonica band, and the, his main talent was he had no teeth, so he used to take his top teeth out and put them in his left pocket, his bottom teeth in his right pocket, and he could really blow a mean heart. <laughs> Now I'm really getting off topic. <coughs> so we're, we're, we're fundamentally biased towards personal explanations, right? I'll try to get to the point. And away from systems ones. So when, you, when I say resilience, you're going to think, oh, yeah, you know, people's coping skills. This is a classic study which also shows we're biased towards the front line in healthcare. People wearing scrubs, you know, people with, if, you know, if you've got nurse written on you, and, and there's a nursing error, then you're the one. You're the schmuck that's going to be tributed to. And Ms. Schott did wonderful work. I used to have the book on my uh, desk at, in, when we had libraries. I used to get it out in French because it made me kind of exotic and leave it lying on the desk. Like I could, un I could understand the pictures, you see. Because what he did was he projected shapes on a screen. And there there's no causality at all. It's just projection. So he'd, uh, he'd have a shape here and he'd move one in like that. Doink. And people would say, and he'd say, what happened? They'd say, well, this shape moved this shape out the road. It banged it, it launched it, was the term he used. So it caused it to move. Then he did this. And people said, oh, this shape moved, and then that shape moved. Removed the causal explanation because there was a time in between. It's really, really important. We give causes to things that are close in time and space to the event. You know, it's the person with the syringe and the person with the patient is going to get their blame because we find difficult to, to attribute to things that happened a long time before. And it's the same with space. People in rooms, elsewhere, making decisions, controllers. It's a train driver that gets it, not the controller. So he did this with shapes, you know. And, and, and depending on the spatial trajectory, people say that well, they were independent events. Are you sort of with me? So the NHS is full of these system causes. It's stretched way beyond where it should be and shortages everywhere. But all the candor stuff's going to come down to people, A, people rather than systems, and B, people at the front line. You're just not, go not going to get a chief exec running down the corridor saying, I'm looking for a patient. And, you know, you say, oh, there's one there. Cool. Right, what it is is, um, you know, I entered into a disastrous PPI um, agreement, you know, six years ago. And, you know, we've been paying through the nose for it ever since. And that's why you've not <laughs> had a cup of tea for 20 minutes. So I'd like to say I'm sorry. <laughs> it's why you can't, you know, things go, that's why things go wrong. It's a, it's a system in which things go wrong because of things like that. But the causal attribution is always going to fall at the front line. So, A, people, and B, front line. And suppose I've got this friend and I say, oh, he's a doctor, he's into patient safety. You would, might say, oh, right, does he go to conferences and symposia and workshops and events? And I say, nah, never leaves the house. Doesn't like flying. <laughs> And you say, oh, he's into sim training and a bit of human factors, yeah, that kind of stuff. You mean that kind of safety stuff? No, 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 he's got a sort of doll phobia, prefers, you know, skin to plastic, <laughs> don't we all? And, uh, and, and you say, no, all right, you mean kind of health and safety equipment, sort of design, you know, the red and black lines, and the red and yellow lines, and uh, black and yellow lines. And four, uh, no, 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 he thinks a bit of common sense, you know, will we'll get you a long way. 
and you say, right, okay, I've got it. It's, it's clinical governance, healthcare informatics. It's that, you mean that, re incident reporting and stuff. No, no, he thinks that's all, you know, tyranny of, you know, arbitrary metrics. Um, he's an academic. He writes about safety. He does a bit of research. No, 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 no. All he does, he, he's won wa awards for safety. No, no, no prizes, just safety of his patients. That's what he's into. It would be a weird conversation. It was a weird conversation because I had it with myself. But um, <laughs> pa patient safety is a thing. It's a racket. It's a racket, right? It is an enterprise, it's a business, it's a thing. If it's, I think everybody here, I say we, I mean you, I have responsibility for undergraduates, but we would agree safety of patients, but that's fine. But patient safety, capital P, capital S, you know, we have to challenge. We have to sometimes disagree about the way it's being approached because it's, a, it's all of those things. It's an academic enter enterprise, it's a research thing, it's got, in his theory and method. And I'm not going to reference all the wonderful talks over the last couple of days, but a lot of this is about needing a theory, and my theories are kind of organisational. completely agree with theories of learning and education as well. It's our duty to challenge it all. And um, my, my challenge really starts with error. You know, to err is human. Well, yeah, I, I disagree. <laughs> it's pretty fundamental. I sort of disagree with this, you know. To wander is human. To err comes from the Latin, to wander, right? So yeah, that's human, to explore our environment. But it's got positive connotations that, you know, you know, let's go for a wander, cool. Human error is what I disagree with. To err is human. If you, if, if you don't search for pornography, um, if you search for uh, uh, cat fails, you'll get the single biggest number of hits on, on Google, I think, still. 101, 101 million results, right? Big, one of the biggest traffics on the internet, right? Cat videos. And deconstructing humor, forgive me, it's, it's, a, it's wrong. But the reason it's funny, and then um, here's my two cats, the reason it's funny is cats have no concept of human error or non-compliance. Cats follow, cats explore their environment and their physical and perceptual skills and they sometimes fall short and they sometimes overshoot and very quickly they are the most incredible mastery learners they, they have this control over the environment that we can only, we could only marvel at. Woodbine here on the right, it's like, he jumps, you know, 14 times his body height elegantly. You just watch this. All cats are like, we're laughing at them. <laughs> and it's the same for children. Children are like that until about school. When children are two or something and they fall over, we don't go, oh, oh, slip, lapse, mistake, you know, <laughs> uh, wrong, wrong ex execution error or anything like that. We go, wee. And that's what you need to do with trainees. And um, <laughs> the reason I love simulation is it's actually a place in healthcare, right? it's the very closest place in healthcare where actually that's what you do do. It's a safe learning environment. We ain't talking about error here. There's not really a right and wrong modality and I love it for that. It's about learning. But we're trying to retrofit what we had as kids. Unfortunately, what happens about five years old, somebody comes along and says, no, that's wrong. And kids then shut up for 20 years because they're frightened to, Explore their capabilities in case they get it wrong. It's deeply social and deeply socially constructed. And the idea that you can have that error model without blame is just a fallacy because in the beginning there was blame in Genesis. The man blamed the woman and the woman blamed the snake. If you've got an error model, someone's getting the blame because it's got the word error in it. That's just the bias. So I'd say, you know, to explore is human, to create, to overcome, to, like I say, to overshoot and undershoot and calibrate our experience against the world. That's the human thing. Human error, capital H, capital E, is just a way of subverting learning, I think, and blame's inevitable. You, again, you probably believe me anyway, but if we trawl through patient safety, you'll see all this. It's, it's about people. It's like, for you, you know, you've got to stand up. So it's, again, a, this appeal to your better selves. Um, think, act, and be safe, that seems sure for the same things. Uh, yeah, let's assume speaking out and speaking up is much the same. Being smart and being wise, yeah, maybe. Being aware, um, don't forget and remember, that's definitely the same, or is it? I'm not sure. And then double check, check again, and safety moment, and safety day, and safety week, and safety month, and <laughs> right, so you're doing it all, Scotland's good, 24-7, 365. <laughs> You have to nurture it, and it's you. It's all about you, and also it's all about everyone. So that's cool. Um, <laughs> but it's all about people, and pr you know, people, people, people. I mean, I'm like, ah, stop, stop, stop for a minute. 
it is, it is a person-centered focus, and all you have to do is try it. All you have to do is try it. Um, you just go into your work and just say, I'm just staying with this patient all day, actually. Sorry? Well, I'm putting them first, you know, and I'm, I'm being aware and I'm being wise, and, you know, and safety matters to me, so I'm just going to stay with this one patient. And people will say, stop, no, 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 we don't mean that. You, you've, we've got targets, we've got an organization, you've got other patients to see. All oh, right, but why is, it not, why is that not on your wristband? You know, put every patient first, but for God's sake, don't miss the target and be careful about the inspection and, you know, like, and, 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 and you'll be too nervous. To why is that not in the, in the model? The answer is it all seems to come down to just ignoring the system and loading it up on the person. And I actually do real science. I just, <laughs> just don't talk about it very much when I come to conferences. But, you know, these are our data. We're building a big data set of organizational and, human and patient factors in the emergency department at St. Thomas's. And the, one at the chart on the right, the hazard function, shows you it's not rocket science for you all at all. The, the, the hazard function for discharge just before the four-hour target. Um, but we train situational awareness all the time, and, and we never mention it, the organizational demands. And yet the only thing people are situationally aware of, only thing, <laughs> is the target, you know. It's the crunching like awareness that people have. And yet somehow situational awareness for us is all about ourselves and not making mistakes and things. But it has to, we talked, we heard earlier about distributed cognition. It has to, we have to take this awareness in a wider sense and what the computer screens are telling you and all the rest of it. And it's all about chunking up the world. Um, the world is fuzzy, but we do have this psychological need. And indeed it's a useful tool, don't get me wrong to make it um, sort of discrete and digital and to codify. And this is a brilliant exa example of a, this is from the Scottish Audit of Sur Surgical Mortality. And I looked at this a, lot, a, a while ago in its wound problems box. And I, can't, I haven't got a pointer, but the second from the top, it says instrument left in wound. And then a bit down near the middle, it says seroma. And I was trying to work out the model behind this. So this was in a book called Beyond Human Error, which is kind of a theme. I said that um, saying that leaving something in a wound is a wound problem is a bit like saying something, leaving something in a taxi is a taxi problem. An instrument left in wound is more like bucket left in corridor than it is like <laughs> seroma. I was thinking psychologically. But we are, we have, we reduce and classify and code and count. And, and there's, if you don't have a model, it's all very ad hoc. You just, you just need a, I'm arguing for a system model, if you like, an organizational model that allows you to contextualize what things are outcomes and what things are, you know, kind of like contributing factors and processes and what things we would like to count and what things we don't really need to worry too much about. And this is a slide from a colleague in the resilient healthcare world, Eric Holnagel. It's basically you just need a model. And I don't mean a model, model like this, where you just put safety in the middle and then scatter anything at all around the outside. <laughs> Forgive me, sometimes I stumble into people who maybe might have had something to do with these things. But I mean an empirically derived model. And forgive me, some of these might be, but it's a good graphic, isn't it? You know, safety and then stuff. Safety and then stuff. That's not quite, I mean, I do mean models, specific models of clinical processes. And there's a paper on our diabetes work at King's College Hospital. And I think if you have a structure like this for simulation, it is useful because quite often you would train simulation in this world and you'd be looking in the middle at decisions, but you'd really only be thinking about maybe clinical aims and treatment. Maybe, maybe a care plan might be in there, but maybe not. It might just be about a specific treatment, specific decisions around aims. And it, it makes you think, well, actually, we're not really focused on organizational outcomes like efficiency, you know, getting this done quick is vitally important in some cases, but that's not really in there. And, and decisions in this context, and it's a pretty generic model, although it did come from work in diabetes, uh, specialist diabetes teams, decisions were all about staffing and procedures and equipment issues as much as they were about patients, and the two things completely trade off. You have all these trade-offs and adjustments that you have to make to the system, which is really the stuff. Anyone wants to leave now? That's it, I'm kind of, that's me finishing at least once. I'll just keep saying that again now for the next sort of 20 minutes. Adjusting to problems in the system characterizes how success gets achieved. And the structure is so important because, you know, you don't just throw the stuff that makes up a human body into a bucket and give rise to life. You know, it's, it's, it's the structures and the interactions that you have to understand. If you can't just do 
a bit of training here, fix a procedure there, throw it all in and, and assume the system will, um, will somehow generate the output you want. But people think you can. This is a slightly tricky bit. People think you can. I mean, some of you will know this stuff. People think there's a plan, and, and this is because safety science starts off outside healthcare, basically. In aviation, but all these other places, it starts in industry, and there's, there's like a manual, a plan, the, the, the system is complicated, but it, you fit together all the parts and it will work, okay? You build it. If you have a problem with something, um, you will get bad output, and then you just look, you trace it back, find out what was wrong, fix it, stick it back together, and the output will be reliable again for a while. It's deeply seductive, and this is the way healthcare safety is approached. You just kind of have to take my word for that, because I know where all the history comes from, that things are fixable, and then you put it back together and the system is good until something else breaks down and you just keep some fixing that. It's called find and fix safety. And it's technical and rational in that everything has its place and you know what everything does and you just need to make sure everything's reliable. But running a ward, for example, is much more like bringing up children. There's another thing I know nothing about. You'll gather there's a theme there as well. These are my, that's my niece and nephews. It's much more like bringing up kids than it is building a internal gear, Sturmy Archer hub thing here, despite the fact we kind of like to draw it as if it is. Um, like bringing up kids, you know, that there are general rules, but there's no manual. There's things people will tell you, oh, I tried that once and, you know, it worked. And then there's sort of folk theories and then there's, there's, there's sort of general principles, a bit of sleep, a bit of food, you know, that usually works, you know, and there's, it's a sort of, the rules are sort of like, try this, should probably be okay, and there are, of course, the fact that I say there's no manual is evidenced by the fact there's 100 million manuals. Everybody thinks they've got a manual, but none of it really gives rise to perfect output all the time. Because <laughs> it's, com it's complex, not complicated. The things in, 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 in families and wards are loosely coupled. There are principles in broad relationships, but nothing is mechanical. We're not dealing with Newton's clockwork universe, and safety has this problem. It come, a lot of safety is like that, and Einstein's a good you know, person to quote. Eh? <laughs> we talk about the difference between work as imagined, as in technical specification, and work as actually done, which is much messier and fuzzier and uncertain. And in this paper, um, uh, in the Annals of Emergency Medicine recently, we were talking about policy, escalation policy. And this, this is a, an editorial that was written alongside the published version by Bob Weirs, who's a lovely man and sadly, sadly passed away this year. And I love this, because he editorial on our work and he said, what frontline workers do, this is ED, he said, they finish the design. I just love the phrase. They sensitively interpret and adapt to the procedure. And this is tacitly acknowledged until such time as something goes wrong. And then it's like, well, why didn't you follow, follow the procedure? You weren't using it the way you were meant to. I was, I was making it work. The, the procedures are just tools to help and you cannot be held up as the world. They are just tools to help. And actually it's the way they're implemented and used that creates success. And so the, the, this is this idea of the imagined world versus the work has done. It's just this myth that you can fully specify and proceduralize everything. You, I, just think, I just think this is nonsense. You can't cross the road without guesswork, but you certainly can't do healthcare. There will be uncertainty. There will be things you don't know, things that are, 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 un, are uncertain, and things that are problematic, and you have to make trade-offs. You have multiple goals, and they all clash, and you've got to make a decision, and you're hoping that you're getting the right one. You sometimes make mistakes, and then people come along and remind you. Next time you do the right thing, when you, uh, uh, next, forgive me, next time, next time you do something and you think it's the right thing, and it turns out later to be wrong, don't do it. You know, uh, what, well, this is dystopia, you know. We can, uh, oh, I could go on. And the, the satire, of course, satire is important. This is why you get these joke manuals. How, you know, I hate, you know, I, I work a manual for marriage, and this, uh, you know, there's no manual. Please forgive me, there are lots of little tasks in healthcare and procedural tasks that of course can be quite tightly coupled and controlled. That's to do with closed and open systems. There's plenty of things which are pretty linear, dose response things and things where you can really tie down procedures. But in general, situations don't have rules, only specific tasks and things. I'm talking really about situations, but perhaps that's for another day. So just, yeah, um, you know, you can't just lube up the head nurse. <laughs> you know, 
and stick her back in and, ho and, and that, that'll do the job, you know. <laughs> so on the phone, you know, I need, yeah, I need three more gerontologists. These ones are totally knackered, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Specification healthcare, you know. So you do need a model, but we like technical, rational models that give us this feeling of control. I do blame psychologists. <laughs> look how, look how <laughs> culturally diverse, classic social psychology. <laughs> right? The psychologists had you, and Gabe really talked a wee bit about this this morning, they, they had you as rats until the fifth, about 57. So, because um, behavioral safety came first, industrial safety was all about behaviorism, okay? So that, that was a dominant model in psychology that people could be conditioned via carrot and stick, you know, punishment and reward models. You might say it's still about a little bit, except they've run out of carrots, you know, but. Um, um, this, is, this was the idea, and then Chomsky came along and said it was gross and superficial to, uh, to call people rats. Gross and superficial, you know, like, we're not rats. Um, but, and we had a chance then for a good psychology, but um, at that point in time, artificial intelligence and computing science had just come around, and, and psychologists, you know, never been the brightest. They're not rats, they're computers. <laughs> and they started drawing circuit diagrams and assuming that cognition in the head was something like this. This is called cognitivism. It's still the dominant paradigm. So all this information processing models. And instead of now being conditioned and punished and rewarded, now you're being programmed. And you might think, no, I'm not. Well, seriously, just look at the wall of any, of any um, <laughs> healthcare unit. This is true, okay, just trust me. The reason that that is the way that people want to drive your behavior is because of cognitive science that believes that you are real, that your, your brain is a digital computer. That's just the, the fact. <laughs> and this is recognition prime decision making and you get yes, no questions. Is the, situational, is the situation familiar? Yes, no, and the action follows. That's not how the brain works. It's much more like this. These, these, it's much more social than that. <laughs> and, and this is why satire, again, the reason, what satire does is it pokes, it pokes fun at the ridiculous. Because you know that's your life at work, not, not that, you know. And so basically you're viewed as robots and you, and can, and you can, you pay, you're kind of passive and you can have the code punched into you and the output will follow. And that's, that's, a, that's, I think that's a wee bit like, um, problematic. And I, I, if there's one reference I show you that I recommend not reading, which is kind of uh, 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 unusual, I suppose, is that one, right? So we wrote this all about this in this book, The Mind, the World and the Body, Psychology After Cognitivism. It's an edited volume of deep linguistics and stuff. And this is why you get all the steps, you know? Doesn't matter how many steps, as long as there are steps. You've got your three steps, your four steps, your five steps. You know, everything has to be stepwise. And, and you don't want too many steps here. Um, it is important, I've actually said it before, it's just it's really important that I, I'm not trying to say that these things are wrong. They are tools, they are tools, tools, tools. Some of them are even called tools. That's the clue. But you go to work with your experience, your hopes and fears, your colleagues, your, 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 your deep, like, you know, vocational calling and all that, and tools. You've got equipment, you've got, like, you know, communication from other people, all your IT databases, and you've got algorithms, and they're all tools to help you. They are not the world. You should not be holding up the algorithm and saying, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, did anyone do this? It's just like, traf you know, systems for crossing the road, red and green. You know, when should you cross? Well, you should cross when there's no car coming so you don't get squashed. <laughs> That's a tool that we've built to help you, and most of the time it matches up okay, but sometimes it doesn't, you know, and you can't just, whatever, it was green, you know. <laughs> don't mistake the map for the territory. Don't mistake the map for the territory. All of which has been sort of recently characterized under this term. So they call it sort of safety one, okay? This is, again, Professor Eric Holnagel in, in Copenhagen, eh, sorry, in Denmark, out, uh, out in southern Denmark in middle fart. And Bryn and I both have some contacts there. And I was out there recently, a couple of weeks ago, examining one of his PhD students and talking about this, so I'll, and I've got something to say about it, that safety one is the, is the latter term for resilience engineering for weird reasons. Um, Safety one, and, and you'll know what's coming. What's coming after safety one? Good. This is, what an audience, you know. Um, 
it's been characterized as safety one to make a change, you know, to say or to have this kind of dialogue about changing the, the ideas and the, um, safety one is that the system is complicated, but the system is good, um, the design is good and plausible, at least plausibly good, as in right staff, right equipment, the right patients come in at the right time into the right place, and if that all works, we get safety. And it goes wrong through failures, breakdowns, errors, definitely errors, but also things like short staffing. That's, these are the causes of the things that go wrong, and all we need to do then is can keep fixing the causes. And also this idea that people can be made reliable light cogs in the wheel. They're just part of the system. Just, just fix them, and then it'll all be cool. And it, this is a little diagram. This is all this is saying, um, that compliance, he calls it. Normal functioning is successful. That's the plan. The work is imagined. And uh, the other stuff is when it breaks down. Um, it follows, of course, you only look at the failures because you want to fix the things that went wrong. You don't really look at when it's going well. You're just like, that's fine. That's just like your engine running. You only go to the garage when it breaks down and you fix the causes. And then you say, we should be OK. Um, I'll, I'll just mention one problem with that because I want to get to the, the end. Um, there's lots of problems. Um, one of them is, so, so it seems a good idea to fix bad things. One of the problems is this idea, you only look at failure. Safety one is predominantly about incidents and adverse things and examining what caused them. Incident reporting, event analysis and all that. If you only do that, you cannot at all establish the risk. And some of you are scientists, you'll know, you know, of, of the malfunction, call it the error, let's say, as a good example. You can't ever get the, the, the risk of errors causing harm by looking only at the failure event. I'm looking at faces here. I'll just say this until I get the look back, which says either, oh yeah, I get it, or Jesus, stop. <laughs> it's like, it's just called transposing the conditional probability. It's like looking at the people on the left here and saying, did you have a climb on a climbing wall when you were, when you were wee? And they go, oh, I, 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 I. So, so but we establish that, and then we, transpose the, the probability and we assume that the people on the right are going to climb Mount Everest one day here on the left. It's not, not the same probability. The chances of you know, harm um, coming from error are very much less than the chances of finding an error once harm has occurred. And safety one just looks out the window when it's raining because it only looks at the harm. And it concludes that errors and things, are, you know, that in this case, clouds always lead to rain, but of course they don't. In order to get any sort of predictive utility, you've got to look at uh, the exposure, if you like, and then the outcome. You have to look at cases where there are violations, let's say, of procedure and not, and harm and no harm. It's just a basic guy square And no amount of rational analysis of, uh, of events can ever tell you anything about the risk. It's, but the root causes really just become a sort of, it's like Aunt Nessie, you know, it's just that the chase is better than the catch. But it'll never tell you this what you, the relative risk, is that sort of clear? You, you're only looking at harm, therefore, when, when people, people will say, well, 80% of harm is caused by human error. Yeah, that's okay, right? But I, I'm surprised it's not more. Once you've had harm, I'm surprised you don't find more violations, errors, or whatever. But that's not the same as saying that 80% of errors will lead to harm. But you do see this kind of like association, like creeping through. The vast majority of Errors, workarounds, violations, communication difficulties in healthcare do not materialize in at least sort of serious harm and quite often in no harm because the system is, is re quite resilient in many cases and it picks it up. It's, it's built in to the flexibility and adaptation that goes on, that things are messy, but usually we get through okay. That's my sort of opinion and it's also backed up by data. It was all written about in this book on the left, which is <coughs> sort of um, <coughs> about safety management, not the book on the right, which is about the Hacienda Nightclub. Uh, um, don't mistake, you know, a book, don't, don't assume that these, uh, the royalties for these two books were the same, by the way. Um, and we wrote about this at highly detailed investigation. This is a long time ago, it's like 15 years ago, if I sound slightly jaded. You know, highly detailed investigation of the last disaster is never going to get you there. And I said, NHS Scotland had learning from experience. I said, we're learning to avoid accidents without having to undergo the experience is surely what, what we should be doing. I think simulation, you know, we, you look, you, you, be, you have to, I think, realize how 
good it is to look at situations and processes where you don't actually know what the outcome is going to be. You know, you get both good and bad outcomes. So much of governance and safety in healthcare is that we've, we've got, we're investigating the bad stuff and trying to work out what caused it in order to fix it. You're just looking at things that go. How do things go? A window in the system, which is where I'm going to finish shortly. And this has all become quite mainstream, actually, within the sort of human factors and safety community now, and safety too. It was called resilience engineering, it still is, and that was just in a conversational way that that name came up with a guy called David Riz just suggested it because of this idea of adapta adaptation to complex systems. And then because of the term, really, the problems with saying resilience and people going, oh, yes, I know, that's about burnout and, you know, that kind of stuff. Eric Holnagel said, let's talk about safety one and safety two and see if we can reorientate the paradigm shift around that. And this is it, right? That's pretty much it. That success and failure come from really the same stuff. It's quite, quite subversive, but relatively simple to say. Um, it's very much like normal accident theory, which is a great book from 1984. It was quite a long time ago by Charles Perrault. He says accident theory has come out of work. We asked, with permission, if we could just extend the model a bit for the, one of these papers. So, yeah, performance to in input variability. The system isn't good. And then just suddenly breaks down. The system is always in a state of flux. There's always demand capacity problems and performance of individuals, teams, and units. And so is always in a just trying to dynamically cope with all that stuff. And that's where success and failure comes from. This is safety too. And we have um, um, our own models. And I'm really always assumed, I'm not going to go through this at all. And I always assume that if you want to talk about any of this stuff, you'll come and then email me and it'll be, it'll be all good and I'll point you at all. There's lots of accessible white papers and things, things that are available, open access and so on. But this is our work model really, but this the variable capacity and demand, constant challenges, never optimal. The system is never really working like clockwork. It's always fluctuating, <coughs> never really predictable. And we monitor, adapt, respond and adjust all the time at individual team levels organizational levels and the good stuff and the bad stuff just comes out that model and then feeds back around and the whole thing just keeps on going like a sort of dynamic system. Right. Um, this is just to scare you and you go, oh my God, and then I just go, right, I'm finishing. So, um, so you could, there's lots of models that are much more explicated and this is one uh, that is about all about dent a particularly easy task, if you like, in dental practice, but bringing in all the functions and activities that, that connect and the, the outcome emerges from all these connectivities. And it's not simple, it's a constant process of adap adapting and adjusting. And this is really the last plea, which is just think of, si I say, it's easy for me in some senses, obviously, think of simulated practice, I, I do like that, beyond as well. Of course you do simulated education and training, but I like the idea of simulation as a way of looking at these activities in this complex system. I, I, I say window on the system, window on the system. You'd be amazed how much governance and safety is just a win, uh, looking at bad things. They'll just look at, and l or looking at people, you know, like I said at the beginning, and focusing on people. So look at the system, look at stuff. Um, have, a, have this kind of idea of human factors model, you know. Um, and I'm going to show you, the last slide is the one after this, you'll be pleased to hear. I'm going to show you another model just to make the point I'm not selling anything here, I'm just trying to enthuse. Um, work through the model with your sim, and this is very much like what people have been talking about for the conference about um, educational models. Try and think what you're doing. The educational ones, it's like, what's your active ingredient of your interventions that's going to lead to change? This is just like, where does your sim sit within the healthcare system that you're in or the unit? And you can. Your models can have nice specificity just to make sure it's maybe of a department or a process or whatever. Work through it. Think of work as done, not as imagined. So make sure that in there you've got things like please the boss, because that's a very important sort of part of healthcare systems. And think who and what's involved. And can you introduce all these things to simulation? And of course, do you want to is a perfectly valid question with a degree of control. Because if you throw it all in, you might find that um, it's very difficult to manage. And so I'll leave you with the the best known human factors sort of model applied to healthcare. It's called SEEPS, S-E-I-P-S-2. And it's, 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 it's the Systems Engineering Initiative for Patient Safety. It's a decent enough paper to understand and read by Richard Holden. And it, 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 I think it's useful. It says, okay, I'm doing this simulation, so what am I actually doing here? Well, 
you know, I've got a person and a task, right? That's what I'm doing. I've got my part task trainer or whatever. It might even be a part task, you know. That's where I sit. It's just useful to know, I think, that you sit there, but there's all this other stuff, you know. Or I'm, I'm doing my non-technical skill. Yeah, I'm doing, co I'm doing situational awareness. Well, that's a sort of cognitive process. I'm, I'm doing teamwork, communication, that's social. There's some behavioral stuff there too. But might, and then I, I focus very much on getting the patient to a certain state of readiness for further treatment or stabilized or whatever. That's a patient outcome. Just makes it explicit. Okay, I'm not really looking at the tools and technology, which may or may not be useful, you know, and may or may voice it upon us and we didn't even ask for them and all that. I'm not looking at that. I'm not inviting the IT people down or the, you know, the people who designed the equipment to actually have some input into how to make things easier for people to do these tasks and stuff. Do you understand what I'm getting at? It sort of explicates the, the wider context of work, the, the regulatory external system, the heat, the light, the noise, and the ergonomics of the physical environment. I'm not manipulating these to see how they affect things. That's totally fine. I think you should know that that's roughly where your, where your system your simulated intervention sits within all the other kind of things that human factors people would find interest. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>
presenters are still here and we can give them their um, prizes. Cool. Oh, thank you. There we go. Um, so, uh, it, obviously, it's been a great conference. I haven't heard all the presentations because you can't be in every room. Um, but I certainly, the, the ones I've chaired have been fantastic. Um, so, best poster, um, uh, we will announce. Hopefully, you're here. There's been so many posters. Um, oh, it's very slow, isn't it? Next. <laughs> I don't know who it is. <laughs> This isn't rehearsed, as you can tell. So, Louise McElwee um, from NHS Arons Ayrshire and Aaron, poster number 60, using simulated patient journey to inform process mapping exercise. Oh, that was such a great poster. Excellent. Is she here? No. Okay, may I just have that for a moment? So, um, we will be sending this on, but I want to just say we've, we've got a lovely book from Wiley, um, How to Teach Using Simulation Healthcare, just been published, so um, everybody's getting one of these, so we ought to um, tweet about that. Thank you. So we will send that on. Uh, best oral presentation uh, goes to Liam Wilson. Is Liam here? So we've got his certificate as well as his uh, presentation prize to give him. So... Uh, Thank you for judging that session on Activity of Development Simulation Hub. Oh, yes, Dash, in North Lincolnshire and Gaul. They put in about 20 abstracts, so that's fantastic that they won one. Well done. <laughs> Probability, hey. <laughs> uh, best workshop. Oh, drum roll. Dun, dun, dun. Sharon Weldon, University of Greenwich. Are you here, Sharon? I know I haven't clapped any of them. I'm trying to hurry up. Oh, OK. Sharon, excellent. Come on down. The price is right. Dun, dun, dun. Fantastic. Are you, are you going to be careful? Come into the light, Caroline. Way back into the photo. <laughs> yeah, really well done. Thank you. Can I just say as yes. well, just because I did it with my colleague, um, Miranda Cronflees, at the top there, so I don't want to take all the credit on my own. It would be really unfair. Oh, so Miranda. round of applause to Miranda as well. <laughs> Uh, when we put this on the website, we'll make sure your name goes on as well, Miranda. Thank you. Uh, oh, best tech room strand presentation. James L. L. Edelman, sorry, Southampton Children's Hospital. Oh, yes, you're here. Hurrah, you made my day. You're going to jump up the front. Be careful, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Be careful jumping down. Oh, health and safety. <laughs> I'm scared. That's it. We've done four. I can't count and I'm tired. Right. Um, I really want to say thank you to the lads in the corner. Uh, Trent Simulation Clinical Skills has been live streaming, uh, laughing and listening to the presentations. Um, really, really grateful. Um, to <laughs> yeah. Just checking that uh, how we access them. Subscribe to be notified the presentation from the breakout sessions have been uploaded. What does that mean? Uh, visit the Trent Simulation Clin Clinical Skills YouTube channel to view the keynote speaker presentations. Sorry. <laughs> I need to go home. <laughs> I'm so tired. Right, massive quick run through of thank yous. Um, uh, our AV team, every year I've worked with them for a, a different conference and they do support Aspie. CPS team, wherever you all are, you're amazing. Woohoo! <laughs> really friendly, really helpful, and nothing's too much trouble. Uh, we need to thank the venue. Uh, they've been very professional. The food's been absolutely spot on. They're very helpful. So thank you. I know they're probably not in the room, but Telford International Centre, uh, internationally fabulous. Thank you very much. Uh, EBS are our uh, uh, administration conference secretariat, and I want Gemma to just pop out. I've got a little present here. She's been amazing as our project manager. <laughs> just a little part of it. She's absolutely been uh, amazing behind the scenes and uh, up front all the conference. So uh, really important, the exec of the ASPE board uh, all supported um, and uh, read all the uh, almost 300 abstracts were submitted, so it was a lot of abstracts to sift through and then create the scientific programme. So thank you guys uh, for that. 
I know you've all been uh, through the exhibition and we've already said thank you to our sponsors that just again, you know, without them and the funding that, that they provide doesn't make the conference happen. So um, we don't need to give them a round of applause. We can do it again with BMJ Stelly, who uh, sponsored your abstract booklet. I think that um, all of that really helps because it keeps the price to uh, a reasonable level. So thank you to them as well. We do that. Oh, technicians get another thank you. So no problem. Yeah. Um, and really importantly, I hope some of them are still in the room. I've just seen one of our student volunteers. Rebecca, Yano and Matt were just amazing. Um, we only managed to get three volunteers. This is an appeal for that volunteers. Our student workforce here today have been uh, uh, just brilliant. There's only been three of you in Orange and you've covered it. But it'd be really great for next year if we can try and get some more. So uh, thank you. Um, and really the last thing is the thanks to you guys for submitting all the abstracts, presenting, being here, staying to the end, you lot especially. Uh, so thank you very, very much. And I've really enjoyed helping uh, coordinate the conference. So thank you, uh, one and all. And we'll just pull out the In It To Win It raffle ticket right now. Come on, Pervs, you do it. Oh, get your raffle ticket out. Drum roll, drum roll. Two, three, one. Oh, oh, no. Oh, someone might have left. Are you sure? Okay, we need another one then. So this is for conference next year. You don't know where it is, and neither do I, but we are having a conference. <laughs> it will be in November. It will be in England somewhere, I think. Maybe Scotland, who knows? 290. 290. Woohoo! <laughs> Please don't go. We'll take your name so we can just make sure you come to either Gemma or myself. Oh, you've got, a, you've got something. I'm so sorry. I've got your bit of paper. You have to come down. I'm so sorry. But anyway, we'll do it in a minute. Brilliant. That's it, isn't it? Have a really safe journey home, everybody. Enjoy yourselves. And hand in your lanyards if you don't want them. We're recycling. Thank you. <laughs>